Yeah, right. I want to talk about A1 connected components of geometric classifying spaces. Um, first thing to note, this is a joint work with Eldon Elmanto and Girish Kulkarni. And maybe, uh, like, what's the context, uh, the, the, the stuff that we want to talk about, what's kind of the questions? Uh, to put everything in perspective, where, where, where we're going. Uh, the general question in, in this kind of area is like, what can this motivic homotopy theory say about uh, like classification of bundles for algebraic groups? Let's say torso classification. And uh, ah, maybe a, a remark, I guess. Um, keep the chat window open if there are, I mean, so if there are questions, please interrupt me. Um, I'm happy to explain uh, things. And uh, well, I have a chat window open, so you can also ask questions uh, via chat or, yeah. Right, so the general question here is we're, interested in actually algebraic questions, maybe, uh, like torso uh, algebra classification of, of bundles under uh, groups over schemes, like vector bundles or uh, also bundles for other uh, interesting groups like orthogonal groups, uh, something about quadratic forms and so on. And um, the question is what we can say with this motivic homotopy theory about these kind of algebraic questions. And so I guess as an outline for what I want to do here is, of course, uh, this question doesn't really, uh, doesn't just come out of thin air. Uh, the, there is actually in algebraic topology, uh, there you can approach questions of well, principal bundle classification uh, via algebraic topology methods. That's then based on representability theorems combined with obstruction theory. And I say a bit about that. So give an idea of how this works in topology and that it works actually quite well. And it allows you to well, classify bundles, like real vector bundles over low dimensional spaces, like low dimensional CW complexes. Then I want to explain uh, how this all translates into a more algebraic setting. Um, so it's the algebraic translation of this topological approach. And that works exactly with this motivic homotopy theory. This motivic homotopy allows to, uh, well, just take this topological approach and uh, translate it to the algebraic setting. And then you get something, and in, uh, in interesting cases, you actually get new and interesting things that tell you something about algebraic uh, geometry that may be, uh, well, impossible or more difficult to, to prove otherwise, maybe. And then, it, uh, so in this uh, algebraic approach, I'll explain later, uh, there actually you have this distinction between rationally trivial and et al locally trivial torsos. That's something that is not really visible topologically. That's something that's specifically algebraic. And I'll say a bit about like, that in the rationally trivial case, a lot can be said about how motivic homotopy can help understanding things about torso classification. Uh, but what I want to focus on in this talk is the et al. Uh, torsos side, where I guess we know a lot less. And so what I want to talk about in this uh, project here is exactly about some homotopical information about these well, let's say geometric classifying spaces that uh, appear when we talk about etal torsos here. Um, 
right? And so the actual math bits that I want to explain, uh, that's, uh, I will most of the talk uh, be concerned with a sheaf that I call H1 et al G. Uh, that is sort of, you can take a pre-sheaf that classifies et al torsos and then take the Nisnevich sheafification of that. And so we can prove a couple of properties of that sheaf, namely that, well, under suitable, uh, reasonable conditions, this thing is homotopy invariant. And it's unramified. And most importantly, all right, so this is kind of a helper gadget uh, in a sense. What we're actually interested in is somehow the connected components of uh, this ge these geometric classifying spaces. And uh, the main point is that this helper gadget H1 et al G can actually be identified with the connected components or the sheaf of connected components of classifying spaces. And uh, this way we get uh, quite a bit of information about the sheaves of A1 connected components of geometric classifying spaces. Namely, they're homotopy invariant and unramified in suitable situations. And maybe I say a bit about applications in the end, although the applications at that point are, I mean, it's not really like we can prove significant results about torsos <laughs> with this, but um, at least we can sort of uh, well, compute the, connected components of classifying spaces in a couple of cases, and, and we can also reformulate purity questions uh, as a question in motivic homotopy. And maybe that's helpful for the future. Okay, so that's the plan. And let's see how far we can get. Um, okay, let's start with a topological picture so that we know what we want to do uh, algebraically later. So in topology, how would you go about uh, with these things here? Well, you can start with a group G that for, I guess, for starting, we can just assume it should be a topological group. And uh, I guess discrete groups fall under this category and classifying spaces for discrete groups are also very interesting. Uh, but you can also look at D groups. Um, in particular, when you're interested in kind of geometric structures um, like vector bundles or, yeah principal bundles under other Lie groups. Uh, yeah, Lie groups is a relevant case here. So what you can do if you have such a topological group, you can look at the classifying space. So topologically here, we can write down two definitions and these two definitions will then also give us something in the algebraic setting, right? One way, of saying what a classifying space is, is I can just say, so the classifying space, that's the BG here. And I can define it as a quotient of some other thing, EG by G and EG should be a contractible space and it should have a free G action. Right. I can take any contractible space with a free G action and then take the quotient of that contractible space by the free G action. And that gives me a space. And then we can prove that sort of up to homotopy uh, equivalence. This space is independent of the choice that we're making here. And that's called classifying space. There is another uh, construction that's sort of a uh, simplicial and it's pretty helpful in particular when we're looking at discrete groups in a way 
Ähm, I can also construct, I mean, so in a sense, that's one way of saying how to construct this EG. I can construct it as a realization of a simplicial set. And that simplicial set is built like I have uh, as n simplices, right? I have the n plus one fold product of the group with itself. And I can then make this into a simplicial set with the usual, I can omit uh, elements, right? So the face maps send, I take an n plus one tuple of elements from G and send it to the n tuple where I remove the entry GI. I, that gives me uh, uh, the face maps for a simplicial set. And then one can prove that the resulting simplicial set is going to be contractible. And that's uh, one way to write down EG. And then I can do the same thing. Right? I can take. So is G a discrete group here? Um, probably it's uh, so for the purposes, if I really do this with uh, just simplicial sets and then take the geometric realization, I want a discrete group. I can also do this as a simplicial space. So if I have a topological group and then take a realization for simplicial spaces. Uh, okay, I see, thank you. I guess I would have to be more careful here. So discrete groups fine for, for the example here. Right, and then I can divide out, uh, there's a, a G action here. I can divide that out and then I get a simplicial set that I can basically write down the N simplices would be elements from the N fold product of the group G with itself. And then uh, the face mass would be given by the usual formulas for the bar construction involving the multiplication for the group. Right, so that is how we, I'm sure that those are sketchy two constructions of, or two descriptions of what classifying spaces are. Um, well, we can ask why is this called classifying space? And for now, it's really just a space that um, is constructed out of the group. And the name classifying space is sort of justified by the fact that this space actually classifies things, namely it classifies principal G bundles. Um, so the answer why classifying space is it classifies principal G bundles. Over topological spaces. Right. If uh, maybe as a reminder, um, but maybe also uh, to yeah. So uh, uh, a definition of what uh, principal G bundles or G principal bundles are, um, and that's sort of what also is called toll source in algebraic geometry. Um, essentially, what we want is. Uh, we have a bundle uh, P to X. So P is a space mapping to X um, with a G action. All right, so I have G times P mapping to P. I want a G action on this P, writing left actions here. You can also do this with right actions. And so the condition that we want is on the one hand, we want a free and transitive action. Uh, it's not a, a fiberwise transitive action uh, of G on P. And one way to write this down is that there is this map from the product G times P. You can map to the uh, fiber product of P with itself over X by doing the following. And so on the one hand, you can apply the action can act with the group element on the point in P uh, and that gives you a point in P and you can also just leave the point alone and that gives you an element in this fiber product of P with itself over X and the requirement here is that this should be an isomorphism. Uh, so this basically means that 
and also uh, this p to x will then be the quotient map. And so you, right here, this means in particular that you have a free action and then you have the quotient map. You can quotient out the G action, I guess then I should write it as a left quotient. Um, and so X is identified with this quotient of P by G and uh, the projection map is the quotient map. And uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is that P to X should be locally isomorphic to just a trivial principal bundle, which is given as you take the product of G with X and project to X. And that's the simplest principal bundle that you can write down. And all the others are sort of uh, locally isomorphic to this, but then there is the, um, the, the, the interest is in the global structure then. And so this is how you can define principal bundles in topology, but it's also how you can define principal bundles in geometry or algebraic geometry because all the constructions that we've looked at here you can write down what a g action is you can uh, write down this map also if you have in an algebraic situation where you don't have topological spaces but algebraic varieties um, and there is one subtlety that uh, i'll come back to later uh, you can then ask that the bundle should be locally isomorphic to the trivial bundle. And in algebraic geometry, you have various choices what it could mean, that the, what local could mean. But for now, okay, that's the definition uh, of principal bundles. And then there is this representability theorem. Uh, I guess Steenrod, at least it's in the fiber bundles book. Um, if we have a paracompact Hausdorff space, that's for topological spaces, not a significant uh, restriction. Uh, then there is a natural bijection. Sorry, that has to go to the next page. Uh, we have a natural bijection. Uh, let me write it like this. And then say what all these uh, mean. So here we're talking about homotopy classes of maps. From the space over which we want to classify bundles from X into this classifying space BG. And this H1XG would just be notation for isomorphism classes of uh, principal G bundles. Over X. So on the right hand side, we have exactly the interesting geometric things, right? We want to know about like vector bundles, if we're talking about GLN or uh, maybe E6 principal bundles over some uh, manifold. Um, that's the thing we want to classify. On the left-hand side, we have uh, just homotopy classes of maps into BG, right? I guess the prototypical case that most people will have seen at some point is that you can classify GLN principal bundles by homotopy classes of maps into the Grassmannians. And uh, so this means that we can translate this, let's say somehow geometric question of uh, bundle classification into a homotopical question. We just need to figure out what are the homotopy classes of maps from a space X into this particular space BG. That is the uh, point of the representability theorem to translate this classification question into a topology question. And then we can ask why this is relevant. Um, uh, well, the thing is that algebraic topology provides methods to compute homotopy classes of maps between spaces. And uh, well, to explain properly what, how this works, uh, would take us a bit too far afield and it's not exactly, it's a bit tangential to what I wanted to talk about. So I just mention it 
here, there is this thing called obstruction theory that can be used to study homotopy classes of maps between spaces. Uh, and in particular here now, homotopy classes of maps from X into the classifying space BG. And sort of the, the relevant information that is the input in obstruction theory, we need to know something about homotopy groups of BG, and we need to be able to compute cohomology groups of X with coefficients in homotopy groups of BG. And then you have this sequence of obstruction classes that allows you to lift to, through the Postnikov tower and uh, lifting classes that tell you how much choices you have. And then sort of, there's a lot of machinery, there is a lot of stuff to compute, but eventually in sufficiently simple cases, if you can work this out, it gives you a description of maps, which then eventually tells you yeah, how to classify bundles in it's too difficult to do this uh, in general, but a lot of uh, specific results and interesting results can be proved with this method. Okay, so that's the topological picture. Uh, we can start from a group G, construct the classifying space in, well, various ways. And that classifying space then classifies principal bundles in the sense that uh, we just need to look at homotopy classes of maps into the classifying space to understand what G, uh, what G bundles are. Okay, so this whole story, we can now try to translate this. And get an algebraic analog. in motivic homotopy theory. So maybe very quickly, so there is this motivic homotopy category of Morel and Wojewodzki. Uh, which is basically, in a way, this is doing homotopy theory for simplicial Nisnevich sheaves or pre sheaves. And what you additionally enforce is uh, Nisnevich excision or Nisnevich descent and A1 invariance. So essentially you're dealing with simplicial things. Ha, I should have said that. For the purposes of the talk, I'm working over a base field and then the sheaves here live on the category of smooth schemes over the base field. And so the rules of the game are that you have this Nevich descent that basically means you uh, if you can decompose your space in, into uh, Nisnevich open sets, then you can somehow compute uh, in a way the homotopy type of the full space in terms of the components. That's uh, what Nisnevich uh, of the components and their intersections. That's what Nisnevich descent says. And of course, there's this A1 invariance built in that essentially says that the fine line is contractible. Right, so again, that's, uh, there are a lot of subtleties and one can talk a long, long time about how to construct the thing, which I don't wanna do. <laughs> uh, once it is set up, it allows to do a lot of algebraic topology arguments for algebraic geometry, right? Because the starting point, the building blocks here are smooth schemes. And in the end, of course, you want to use this motivic homotopy theory to say something about smooth schemes that can, well, yeah, say something that cannot be said otherwise, maybe. So we can proceed as in topology, as we did before, take a group 
and look at the classifying spaces. So here, we would really look at algebraic groups. Most of the time, I guess for the purposes of this talk, you can assume that their groups are reductive. Um, but yeah, for, for now, everything can be done basically with any algebraic group. And then we want to talk about classifying spaces. And as I said before, um, where did I say it here? When we talk about principal bundles for the group G in algebraic geometry, we now have a choice here with respect to which topology do we want the things to be locally trivial. And that choice that it is there is reflected here that you can sort of come up with different classifying spaces that say something about torsos that are locally trivial in the whatnot topology, right? So you can choose your topology, Zariski, Misnevich, et al., or then like FPPF, FPQC, and potentially all these will be different classifying spaces. So for now, what are the two things that I want to talk about here uh, is on the one hand, there is the thing I would like to denote B Nis G. That has something to do with rationally trivial torsos or with torsos which are locally trivial in the Nisnevich topology. Um, and that's something that we can construct via the simple shell construction. Right, if we start with EG as a simplicial, well, now we can take simplicial sheath, um, n plus one many copies of, uh, so the product of yeah, n plus one fold product of uh, G with itself, uh, and then to define BG as EG mod G, or write down BG itself as a simplicial object, which has in degree n, the n fold product of G with itself. Uh, and if you just write this down as a simplicial sheaf, then you get this object B miss G. That's one thing. And the other thing, uh, I tend to denote this B at G um, alternative notation in the literature, in particular in the paper of Morel and Wojewacki, is a BGMG. So let's say that would be geometric classifying spaces. Maybe I should say, I mean, so in, uh, in the constructions is, it can be found in the A1 homotopy of schemes, uh, paper of Morel and Wojewacki. But the idea is also at the heart of Totaro's definition of Chow groups of classifying spaces. So this is a more um, algebraic construction, whereas this thing here really, we're talking about simplicial sheaves right from the start. And uh, on this side here, and that's what justifies talking about geometric classifying spaces, is in some sense, let's go back to the previous thing that we had. In topology, you can take any contractible thing with a free G action and divide out the group action. So that's a way of saying, yeah, Borel construction maybe. And uh, now you can try to do this algebraically, right? Try to come up with a scheme. Yeah, well, maybe contractible, maybe not really contractible, but uh, at least a scheme with a free G action and then divide out the G action. That's basically what is happening in algebraic geometry. Take this uh, idea and translate it directly. And how you can do that is basically you take V, a representation of G, and then inside there, you can take a closed subset, subscheme. Yeah, we're only interested in the complement, so we can take closed with a reduced structure, such that uh, G X freely. outside Z, right? 
then uh, we can take u to be the complement of z in v. That's now an open subscheme in a, a representation of g. And then we can just take the quotient. All right, so then we can take u mod g. Uh, and then that is an approximation, say an algebraic approximation of the classifying space. Is this thing a scheme? Yes. So we have, um, I mean, the representation we think of as uh, a fine space. I right? would take a finite dimensional representation. So we can think of this as an affine space. Then we have this G action on it, and we're uh, removing sort of everything that makes uh, that gives us problems. <laughs> we're removing things where G may not act freely, and uh, then uh, you you get an open subset on which the G acts freely. And so, depending on your definition, this already means that you can uh, take the quotient and get a scheme, which will actually be smooth. I also have a question. So uh, you, you said that the first thing um, corresponds to Nisnevich topology and the second thing to the Etal topology. But in the definition, it is, uh, it is not apparent from the definition that one thing is Etal and uh, the other one is Nisnevich. So could you explain this? Um, so for the Nisnevich topology, I will mention the representability uh, theorem that tells us that we actually really uh, classify uh, torsos that are locally trivial in the Nisnevich topology. Um, so uh, what we get here is in a way, so I mean, why, why et al topology? Essentially, the question is, you start with something where the group acts. And then you're taking a quotient and you can take this quotient in various categories, right? You can take it as uh, Nisnevich sheaves, you can take it as et al sheaves, you can take it as FPQC sheaves or as schemes. And what happens here is because this quotient is gonna be a smooth scheme over a field in the situation I'm, I'm in. Right? This quotient is gonna be a smooth scheme over a field then this bundle here, uh, this is a, a G bundle Right, let's say u to u ma g. This is a g bundle, and it will actually turn out. Although I mean, you need a couple of algebraic geometry results, like uh, results of Sechardi and, and so on, to say uh, that this g bundle is actually locally trivial in the et al topology. Okay, thank you. So, so there is the topology somewhere there. A priori, I guess you would only get that it is locally trivial in the FPQC topology, but then with Sechardi's results, you get that it's locally trivial in the et al topology. And maybe that's a good point. I'm sorry, G here is a group of which sort? Uh, we can take an algebraic group, but we can also specialize. So yeah, then maybe. Okay, thank you. Write it here. Um, for all the talk, I'm working in schemes over a field. And then here, I really want the algebraic group to be defined over the field. And it's really everything here is in, in schemes over a field. And do I need it to be smooth? I'm sorry, can you repeat that, please? The, do you need it to be smooth? Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. So probably linear algebraic group uh, is, and I want it to be smooth, yeah. Not quite sure what happens with Frobenius kernels. <laughs> Okay, so, but generally the, the most relevant cases I'd say would be here. You just take a simple algebraic, uh, simple linear algebraic group, in the usual classification. So easiest case to think about GLN, uh, but also, I mean, 
I personally like to think about G2 at some point, sometimes. Those kind of groups. Right, maybe uh, to point that out here, uh, to say something about this difference here. So generally the two constructions are different. So what happens when you do this thing with this Misnevich sheaves, uh, you're basically, uh, or uh, yeah, when you do this construction, you're basically taking the Nisnevich topology to, to build your quotients. And here, as I have mentioned, uh, you're taking the et al topology. So generally these two constructions give you different spaces. Uh, they agree for the so-called special groups. Uh, that means uh, groups where all et al locally trivial torsos are automatically the risky locally trivial. So the most important examples are like GLN, SLN, SP to N, right? In these cases, the two constructions give you the same thing and there's no problem, uh, no, uh, nothing to, to worry about really. But in general, these two constructions will be different because somehow the, the quotient in the Nisnevich topology and the quotient in the Etel topology by the G action will be different. And that's what is somehow behind the construction of the classifying spaces. Okay, so, right. So we have these two, two objects here. B Nis G and then B et al G or B uh, G M G, uh, geometric. Uh, so the thing that's better understood is this B Nis G. So that really classifies, let's say rationally trivial torsos or what is the same thing because he's typically working over smooth schemes here. Uh, that's this Nevich locally trivial. Torsos. So there is an analog of the classific uh, of the representability theorem that I want to mention here. That's by Arvind Asok, uh, Mark Oya and myself. And uh, so the original uh, version of this uh, is by Morel for vector bundles. And sort of the final result uh, in this form is uh, applicable much more generally. So we can work over any field. G should be an isotropic reductive group over F, where isotropic, I just want to mention it, uh, means that you have somehow a GM inside it. I guess if I want to say it properly, I have to say that every, uh, for every almost simple, almost direct factor of G uh, in the derived subgroup, there should be GM as a subgroup. But if you just think about where, I mean, so also where does the isotropic name come from? If you think about the orthogonal group for a quadratic form, then the orthogonal group is isotropic if and only if the quadratic form is isotropic. And the GM you get from trans, uh, transformations that you can define on the hyperbolic plane that you would have there. And then, uh, as in the topological case where we had to restrict to paracompact Hausdorff spaces. Here, we have to restrict to smooth affine schemes over F, but then we get a result just as in topology. So just a few more decorations. Uh, 
but the, the meaning is in some sense still the same. So what we have on the left-hand side is the homotopical side. Here we have like homotopy classes of maps, whatever this motivic homotopy theory computes in a sense. So it's homotopy classes of maps from X, this smooth affine scheme into this classifying space. And on the right-hand side, we really have isomorphism classes of Nisnevich locally trivial torsos or principal bundles. And do I get it correctly that the main ingredient in the proof of such an isomorphism is that the right hand side is a one invariant? Yes, that's essentially the key point. Um, so what, in some sense, the left hand side is by definition has uh, some sort of Nisnevich excision and A1 invariance. And so the Nisnevich excision is, uh, on this side is also okay because you can sort of glue torsos in the Nisnevich topology. Uh, and the key ingredient here is that this thing needs to be A1 invariant. And then you have to work the machinery of motivic homotopy uh, just enough to, um, but then that, that's the key geometric ingredient is the A1 invariance for rationally trivial torsos. Yeah. So in a sense, this B miss G really uh, somehow deserves the name uh, classifying space. It really classifies this Nevich locally trivial torsos. And then one can study, that's the same thing as in topology. That now you can try to understand these A1 homotopy classes of maps from X into B is G via obstruction theory. I translate a lot of the topological methods into this motivic homotopy uh, setting. And then you can get some information about this and then by the representability theorem about this, uh, torso classification. And the inputs that you need is you need some information about homotopy sheaves of this classifying space. And you need to be able to compute the cohomology of X with coefficients in these uh, homotopy sheaves, really very much like the topological picture. And uh, so... Oh, sorry, do you go into the stable motivic, uh, homotopy category for this aim or do you need to use uh, stable motivic homotopy category here? No, this is really all unstable. So uh, the, in some sense, to be closer to the geometry, you still have to be uh, in the unstable motivic yeah, homotopy. I, I mean, this method uh, to make this abstraction theory it is uh, still kept in uh, unstable category, yes? Yes. So in oh. particular, you also need unstable motivic homotopy sheaves of these classifying spaces. Yes, yes. OK. Right. So working the motivic homotopy and uh, also computing homotopy sheaves here is, uh, can be uh, difficult sometimes. Uh, but so things can be done and there have been some applications. So I guess the first uh, application where also Morel developed uh, the obstruction theory here in this A1 setting and developed a lot of the structure theory for homotopy sheaves in this motivic homotopy theory. Uh, yeah, that's Jose Morel. He sets up an Euler class theory. For vector bundles that can and, and showed that they control that they are the first obstruction that Euler classes are the first obstruction to splitting of line bundles from vector bundles. And uh, those results were then extended by Arvind Ashok and uh, Jean Fazel. And so they actually got some classification results for vector bundles over low dimensional schemes. Uh, 
and uh, actually application to splitting questions. So investigating questions like if the Euler class is trivial, what's the next obstruction to splitting off a trivial line bundle from a vector bundle and what can be said about this obstruction and when does it vanish and, and so on. Uh, so you really get geometric applications from these methods, having the representability theorem plus uh, the uh, obstruction theory. And yeah, maybe So also in uh, joint work with uh, Arvind Asok and uh, Mark Oyua, uh, we could also say something about octonian algebras. So that's G2 bundles. Uh, with trivial norm form. So <laughs> there's a funny example of a G2 bundle over a five dimensional smooth affine complex variety that sort of to all other eyes than Motivic, uh, are, uh, this bundle looks very trivial. It has a trivial norm form, it has a trivial underlying vector bundle. If you take the complex realization, it's going to be holomorphically trivial, uh, but the only way to see the, the non-triviality of this G2 bundle is via a mod three motivic cohomology class. And that also comes out of this um, framework of studying torsos using representability theorem and obstruction theory. So this is the thing that, so when we talk about these two classifying spaces, the rationally trivial side, this bean is G here, we understand that to some extent, at least as much uh, so that we can get some interesting results out of it. And now we can look at this side uh, because uh, if we're not in the special case, right? So for vector bundles, we don't need to worry about the difference between geometric and Misnevich classifying spaces. Uh, but like for other groups, these two objects will be different. Right. If you look at quadratic forms, a quadratic form will not necessarily be trivial. So if we're looking at a quadratic form over a smooth affine scheme, right, this will not necessarily be trivial when you restrict to the function field of the, of the smooth affine scheme. Um, so there is a lot more that is, uh, well, that's not here, let's say. And so one would like to also say something about these uh, geometric classifying spaces uh, and maybe uh, this way say something about torsos that are not necessarily rationally trivial. Right? So as long as you are forced to work with this Venus G, you're only talking about rationally trivial torsos. And that's uh, like for quadratic forms, uh, quite restrictive. So that's the thing, right? On the other hand, so this B et al G or the geometric classifying space is not that well understood. Let's say from a motivic homotopy viewpoint. So what we can still say there's still a classifying map, right? So we can write this. This is again notation. So this, this H1XG notation I had before, this is isomorphism classes of etal locally trivial torsos uh, for the group G over uh, scheme X. So, excuse me. So, uh, so this etal, etal classifying space exists as a scheme and Nisnevich only as a simplicial scheme, right? Um, it, it, it's an int scheme, let's say. So uh, maybe I... Ah, I see. So, yeah, yeah. so uh, the thing if, is, if you start with a finite dimensional representation um, and you remove the non-free locus, whatever you get here, this U is not contractible. 
Ah, I see. And then you take the quotient by G. What you then need to uh, to do, and I should have said it before, <laughs> thanks. Ah. Uh, you can now take a sequence of representations where the co-dimension of this non-free locus grows to infinity. Uh -huh. And then the, you get a sequence of such approximations, U mar G of the classifying space, and then sort of you need to take a co-limit. So you get an int scheme. Okay, so the, 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 one, the one thing is int scheme, another thing is a, a simplicial scheme, right? Yeah. But so so they both are motivic uh, motivic spaces, but there are no maps between them. Any obvious one? Uh, actually, there is a map from in the B Nis to B et al. And. To some extent, I would like to say this is the inclusion of the connected component of uh, the base point. <laughs> um, so th this this map comes because sort of Nisnevich locally trivial torsos are etal locally trivial. That's sort of the, the the origin. So there is there is a map that you can write down, but it's not necessarily a, not generally a weak equivalence. Oh, and sorry, possibly you explained this already. May I ask again, if we take simplicial Nisnevich sheaves and take this factor in uh, this category, uh, uh, is it the left side or not? I mean, the gametopy category of simplicial Nisnevich sheaf and we take such a gametopy uh, uh, factorization if it, is, if it has since. Sorry, can you say that again? Uh, so uh, if we consider the uh, gametopic category of simplicial uh, Nisnevi sheaves, and in this category we try to make the right side construction, not in the category of schemas, but in this category. Uh, is there a sins uh, for this, and is it the left side? Is it equivalent to the left side? If we take such a in limit of uh, uh, complements, but we take the factor not in the schema category, and we try to do this in yeah, I think you get the you get the Nisnevich because then the quotient will essentially be a quotient of Nisnevich sheaves. Okay. Yes. Same. Yeah. So I, I think in this setting you get the left hand side. You get G. Mm -hmm. And this basically gives for that map that you said, right? right. I mean, from yes. B needs to be it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then uh, sort of the, the reason for the difference uh, that these two things are not necessarily the same is that sometimes the quotient as Nisnevich sheaves is different from the quotient as et al. sheaves or the quotient of schemes. Right, so we still, so in this setting, when we try to understand what uh, this B et al G is now, so we still have a classifying map. So we can go from et al torsos. So uh, as I said before, right? So this is the notation for, we take et al locally trivial torsos for the group G over the scheme X. And uh, this can be mapped now into homotopy classes of maps in this A1 homotopy category from X to this B et al G. And uh, in, so the, the easier way of saying how this works is if I have a torso, E over X, I can write down an et al uh, trivialization, right? So I have this, uh, uh, I have a uh, covering of X by et al opens and uh, over the individual opens and I have trivializations and I can compare these trivializations. So I can take this trivialization and make a map out of uh, this. In, from X into BG, which basically says uh, for two opens, so yeah, I have one etal map uh, UI to X and another etal map from UJ to X. And over UI and UJ, I get a trivial torso and I actually have a fixed trivialization. Then I can compare these two trivializations over 
the fiber product, which is basically the intersection of the two opens. And the map goes to G, and that's sort of the uh, uh, transition map between the two trivial, uh, yeah, the two trivializations. And that, but that's really the construction in the homotopy category. I I'm sure this is, this can be done better, very explicitly algebraically. But <laughs> um, so in the homotopy category, you can then take all these uh, transition maps that describe basically how to glue the full bundle. And that extends to a map from the check simplicial scheme associated to this etal covering into, well, a suitable replacement of B et al. G. And sort of in the first, in the, in the base degree, this is just given by the transition maps and you can extend it to the higher intersections because you have a co-cycle condition. When you say that it maps to the suitable uh, replacement, it is, is it just the simplicial construction? I uh, probably, uh, I mean, to be really sure that I get the map like this, I probably really have to take a vibrant replacement in the motivic homotopy category. So that uh, iterates the singular simplicial construction to enforce the A1 and also the vibrant replacement for the missing topology. And this simplicial thing here, that's equivalent to X, and this is sort of how you get the map. That's not particularly explicit, I I'm sure. One can do better, but uh, just to get a rough idea. So we still have a classifying map. We can go from torsos to an associated homotopy class of maps into the classifying space. But the problem is, um, so in the Nisnevich case, when we have, instead of this et al here, we have Nisnevich, then the representability theorem says this is a, a, a bijection. So here in the et al case, this is not a bijection in general. So yeah, I guess both sides here are difficult to compute. So this one and this one, right? This one is what we want, want to actually understand with all these difficult methods. And uh, this sort of is also by definition complicated. So there are, I don't think I know an instance where I can compute both sides and see that they are different, but they behave differently. And that, that's enough to say that we cannot get a bijection in general. So the key point, that came up before with the Nisnevich. The key point for the representability theorem is the A1 invariance for a, a rationally trivial torsos. And here, if we're talking about etal torsos, this can fail to be. Homotopy invariant. Right, there is this great example the due to Parimala, which is an SO4 torso. So it's in a product space over the affine plane over the real numbers, which is not extended. From spec R. So that says that the torso classification over the affine plane is different from the torso classification over the base field. And this means that this kind of homotopy invariance, the torso classification doesn't care about ANs, is just not true for etal torsos. So, uh, excuse me. So, uh, is it the same thing as uh, um, the phrase like uh, the quadratic analog of Serre's problem is not true? Yes, yes. Uh, that, that's, that's exactly the thing. So there is this uh, book by Lam on, the, uh, on Sarah's problem and it also has a section or a chapter on uh, the quadratic analog and what is still true and what is not true. And uh, so Parimala's uh, example in particular is also discussed in there and uh, a lot of other interesting things as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So but this means that we have uh, a question now here, 
right? So we still have the classifying map. We have somehow a natural, uh, a natural candidate what uh, this B et al G could classify, namely et al locally trivial torsos. That would be fantastic. Uh, but the world is not that nice. And so uh, this is not a bijection. And so we have the question, like, what does this B et al G actually classify? Um, and I guess, as a, at least I don't know. <laughs> I have a partial answer. So at this point, we cannot really say what it, what it classifies. We you know it's not going to be directly uh, it's how locally trivial torsos. Of course, there's a, an easy way out, right? We can just say, we can define, uh, say, well, we call a motivic torso something that we have on the side and then say, yeah, okay, BSLG classifies motivic torsos. It doesn't really help us. Uh, because then we still have the question, like, what is the relation between those motivic torsos and actual algebraic G principal bundles? Yeah. Maybe, uh, yeah, maybe I write this first before I make the remark. Um, so more precisely, we would like to say, or like to know what's the relation between like these ATAL locally trivial torsos uh, and maps from X into B ATAL G, right? So what can we say here? How bad is the situation? How different can these things be? Um, and of course, in the end, we would like to say, yeah, in the ideal world, <laughs> Um, or semi-ideal because it's not ideal because it's not a bijection. But uh, the, the next best thing would be that these things are still close enough that we can say some non-trivial things about etal torsos with this motivic homotopy theory. Maybe as a side remark, I like to point out this analogy in complex analysis. You can start, uh, look at, so take a complex manifold, take a complex Lie group, and then you can ask questions about, uh, again, bundle classification, G bundles over X. Um, and there you also have this kind of situation that you can ask, well, you can try to classify holomorphic bundles, so holomorphically locally trivial things. Uh, holomorphic trivializations and then up to holomorphic isomorphism. So, and uh, you can also ask the topological question, just continuous trivializations and continuous isomorphisms between the bundles. And then typically these two things will be different. That uh, sort of the more geometric things, the holomorphic stuff and uh, just basic topological things, the continuous stuff. And it's somehow a similar situation here. Right. So here you have the algebraic stuff and here you have somehow the continuous stuff in the sense that whatever you get in the motivic homotopy category would be somehow continuous maps. They're only locally algebraic and uh, then they fit together via sort of locally algebraic homotopies and so on. If you try to figure out what the mapping, the, the, the maps in the motivic homotopy category are. And so uh, we should not expect that this has a, 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 such a simple answer. I have a very naive question about this. So Primal example says that this map is not injective, right? Yes. And do you know that it is not subjective in some cases? No. So far, I do not know an example uh, where this is uh, not subjective. Um, because the problem is, again, to, to sort of sufficiently understand this and figure out uh, so what it is. I mean, so writing down a map from X to B et al G is difficult. And then it's also not so clear how you can, and you would also need additional invariants to figure out that whatever you've written down cannot possibly represent it by a torso. So I don't have an example uh, subjectivity. I, so that that's certainly a very interesting question. Okay. 
Yeah, but you probably want to, to talk about this just later, but uh, if you put X to be a point, Okay, yeah, uh, that's that's a good point. I probably should mention that one thing that we can prove at this point is that if you put in a field, the spectrum of a field here, then you actually get a bijection. But that is also already, uh, there is something non-trivial uh, to be proved that sort of the, even over a field, this like vibrant replacement that's behind this writing down homotopy classes of maps, that this does not introduce any new relations between torsos that are not, that are sort of weaker than isomorphism. Yeah, so that's that's one of the uh, things that we can prove that over fields you get a bijection here. You can put here any field or just the base field? No, that would be actually any extension of the base field. I mean, so there are uh, a couple of weak restrictions uh, on the like behavior of torsos over affine lines that you have to make, but in general situation, like in a connected reductive group of a characteristic zero field, then you would really get uh, that it's not just over the base field, but really over any extension field. Okay, so right. So the, the question is, that can be asked at this point is what does this uh, BLG classify? Or also, how far is the map up here from being an isomorphism or a bijection? And so the thing that what, what we uh, do basically is uh, we can show that the sheafification of this map here is an isomorphism. So we can pass to Miss Navid Shivification. So from this, so maybe I should have said that here. Uh, this, if, if I, I mean, so this is, uh, both sides are contravariant in X, right? I can pull back torsos and I can compose with maps here. So what I'm actually writing down here, or the, this classifying map, uh, you can show that this is compatible with these pullbacks so that you actually get a pre sheaf map here from etal torsos to these homotopy classes of maps. So you get a pre sheaf map sheaves on the category of smooth schemes. And now you can sheafify with respect to the Misnevich topology. I guess I want to write the sheafification in the Misnevich topology as this A this. And then I have H1 et al. And here I could put in a smooth scheme. Um, and this is the object I want to right as this curly H1 et al of the group G. And then here, I have the Nisnevich chiefification of something. The something is uh, I can put in a smooth scheme X and then take maps into the et al classifying space or geometric classifying space. Uh, that is actually, if I have X maps to this gadget, this is the a1, the, the, uh, the, the pre sheaf of A1 connected components. If I Nisnevich sheafify, I get the Nisnevich sheaf of A1 connected components. So I can again shortly say what these things are. This is sort of the, uh, well, I mean, this, let's say, a sheaf of local G torsos. I don't really have a good name for this. So if you would think about what does this uh, Nisnevich chiefification do, it means you have really a collection of uh, torsos locally in the Nisnevich topology over your scheme. And they don't necessarily fit together with all co-cycle conditions or anything, because then you obviously would be able to glue. So you just know that uh, over the intersections, the torsos become isomorphic, but you don't necessarily have a co-cycle condition. That's basically what you get. So it's a sheaf of local G torsos. And this here is the sheaf 
of A1 connected components. And so um, maybe I can now formulate, uh, maybe I should say what the results are. So what are the results? Um, under some conditions on the group G, we can prove the following things. One, that the Sage 1 et al of G is homotopy invariant. B, this H1 et al G is unramified in the sense of uh, that, that that's used in, in Morel's book, unramified uh, sheaves. And uh, then we have this H1 et al G mapping to the sheaf of connected components is an isomorphism. So what does this mean really all in all? What we had before I talked about the Parimala counterexample, right? So the, the, if we look at the pre-sheaf etal torsos, actually isomorphism classes of etal torsos, that can fail to be homotopy invariant and you have these kind of problematic torsos in particular over affine, just over affine spaces already. And um, the thing is, the first result here is, if you then Nisnevich sheafify, these problems go away. All these problems that we have with homotopy invariance for torsos are not there in Nisnevich locally. Actually, you can already see, and this is, uh, I mean, not uh, in the formulation, the problems go away in Nisnevich locally, but in uh, some other formulation, it is already in Lam's book that, uh, that you can actually find a Nisnevich covering of the affine plane here over which the pieces then become extended from spec R. So it's already visible in this example that it's sort of, that everything's okay in Nisnevich locally. And we can more generally uh, prove that under reasonable conditions that this sheafification of et al torsos is homotopy invariant. Can also prove that it's unramified, which basically means that uh, the sections are just determined by what happens over the generic point and over the co-dimension one points. So, and that's sort of something that allows us then to actually compute things. And uh, then, sort of, this is the the helping tool because to prove homotopy invariance and unramified, we need statements about torsos, and so we can make statements about this H1 et al G, and then in the end we can actually identify this H1 et al G with the sheaf of connected components and then get that these properties here hold for uh, the et al classifying space. So the, the sheaf of connected components there as well. And maybe uh, in the remaining 15 minutes, maybe I explain a bit more uh, about why these things should be true and uh, maybe also say something about where, which conditions on G are needed. So here, this H1 et al G is homotopy invariant. We need some conditions. Uh, as I said, what are the conditions? So one of the conditions is, or let's say, I'm, 
this doesn't really enforce much conditions on G, to be honest. Uh, I'm trying, I mean, so I'm, I'm formulating it like that to make explicit that uh, where a sort of geometric input uh, uh, comes, or what sort of geometric input is needed here. And so one of the things that we need is the Grotenik Zero conjecture. And the other thing that we need is that G torsos over, I should satisfy a very weak uh, homotopy invariance, namely G torsos over affine lines should be extended. for all extension fields of the base. And sort of, uh, the Grote and Dijkser conjecture. What's that? That's basically the statement that uh, H1 et al of spec R uh, G injects into H1 et al spec K G if R is a regular local F algebra with fraction field K so that means that torsos that are rationally trivial over a regular local uh, F algebra are already trivial. And here I want an injection or that torsos that become rationally isomorphic are already isomorphic. And uh, that's now uh, known in uh, the generality we need. So for G reductive, uh, this is known over arbitrary fields and then for infinite fields. This is a work of uh, Fedorov and Panin. And then there's an extension of this finite fields by Panin. So why do so we- do, do, Excuse me, do you need uh, the, uh, uh, the assumption that G is isotropic for this or, or you don't? No. I Sorry. think the results are really just for, uh, yeah, I guess uh, that was the, also some, some new uh, uh, progress that was made possible using the affine Grassmannians and so on. That is also for anisotropic groups that this works. Okay. And by the way, what would happen if we replace Atal with Nisnevich in, uh, in the statement? So how, it, how is it called at least? Um, so in the Nisnevich uh, case, then, Uh, I mean, so in, in some sense, you can say that the kernel of this map here is the Nisnevich locally, uh, is the Nisnevich locally trivial torsos. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's the best formulation to, 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 to say how the Nisnevich case fits in. And it essentially says that Nisnevich locally trivial torsos over regular local rings are already trivial. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the, uh, yeah, the Grodin Dijkser conjecture, that's the thing that, I mean, so where is that needed? Uh, this means that this sheafification here, uh, maybe I say it like this. So why is this needed? Uh, this allows us to say that H1 et al G over R, uh, actually over a general X. So these local torsos over X, they embed into the, the sections of H1 et al G over K if X is irreducible smooth with function field K. 
right? So this chiefification then means is detected on function fields and there's nothing like sections over a scheme that vanish when you restrict to the function field. So those sections would also have to be, already have to be trivial. And uh, the other, so that's where the Grotendieck Sarah conjecture is needed. And then the other statement here, G torsos over affine lines are uh, extended from the from L here for all extension fields of F. That's sort of if you want to check homotopy invariance. So you need to compare the sections of this H1 et al G over X times A1 and X. With the Grodin de Serre conjecture and this thing here, it suffices to check that. Uh, the sections over A1 of the function field are the same as the sections over the function field of any smooth scheme, right? So the grotendieck sarah conjecture allows to reduce this general homotopy invariant statement to just a statement over affine lines over fields. And that's now the point, uh, maybe I say that here, like when do we have that etal torsos over affine lines are the same thing as etal torsos over the field there. Uh, that's sort of what I'm saying here under reasonable conditions on G. This is uh, where these conditions come from, this A1, this very weak A1 invariance. So, and now to have a list of things where this result and homotopy invariance of the sheafification applies, uh, we have G connected reductive over a field of characteristic zero. Uh, there the uh, key input is The work of Raghunathan and Ramanathan who have uh, thought about uh, torsos over affine lines and when they are extended and so on. And then you can actually get that for connected reductive groups over characteristic zero fields, such a thing always holds. Uh, then, so, and that already is quite a number of uh, groups to which uh, the, this homotopy invariance result applies. So also for the orthogonal group, I'm sorry, when you say about homotopy invariance, do you mean homotopy invariance for affine varieties or in general? No, homotopy invariance here is really uh, this L over F is just an extension field of the base. So I really just require homotopy invariance for affine lines over fields here and here. And it, and the... Thanks. Uh, uh, that is really for smooth things. Okay, so a fine is needed on the geometric side, usually, yes? Thank you. Yeah, so this is really, uh, I don't need just, uh, F, uh, or we don't need a fine. It's actually true for uh, smooth schemes in general. But that's also due to the shivification that a lot of the problems go away. Uh, right. Sorry, so for, can you say the definition? Uh, what does mean are extended for um, field extensions? What does mean the source are extended by the definition? What it mean? Uh, the torsos are extended. I always have a restriction map here, right? I can pull back a torso L to uh, A1L, and the statement that torsos are extended over affine lines here means that they all come as pullback from L. Oh, so okay. they're all constant, uh, but th that's sort of the, I mean, so. So, but, but, so, so surjectivity from the left side to the right is by this uh, assumption, you can say by this ingredient. Mm. Um, so the, the torsos over L, they always inject into the torsos over A1L uh -huh. because you can evaluate, you can yes, take yes, a yes, rational yes. point and pull back along that. Uh, and so, sorry, yeah. so these references which you list, I can I try to understand. It is references where this property is proven. 
Um, fact, not completely, but sort of the main geometric input. Form for the statement that they extended. Yes. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. For the orthogonal groups, we have also this homotopy invariance for affine lines over fields of characteristic not two. That's a theorem of Harder. And uh, then, so for PGLN over fields where the characteristic, sorry, and N are co prime. Uh, that's, I mean, I, that needs some how. You can use results about Brouwer groups. Um, there's a theorem of uh, Auslander and Goldman about Brouwer groups over affine lines over uh, separately closed fields. And from there, you can then work your way to the classification of PGL and torsos and, and uh, get that this homotopy invariance here is also satisfied there. Yeah, okay, uh, my time's up. So let me uh, just uh, go over what I said now for the homotopy invariant. So we can prove that this um, uh, sheaf of etal torsos is homotopy invariant by putting together like the groton deek zero conjecture, which allows to reduce a lot of questions from smooth schemes to their function fields. And uh, in particular, the homotopy invariance question reduces to a question of etal torsos over affine lines. And then there are a number of cases where we actually have that homotopy invariance for torsos over affine lines. And then this sheaf of torsos is gonna be homotopy invariant. So what else we can prove is, maybe I just say one sentence. B, this H1 etal G, is unramified. Uh, again, here we need a condition. And the condition is an actually if and only if condition. Uh, and the if and only if condition is if local purity is satisfied for G. And local purity means that you can go from torsos to the intersection over the co-dimension one points of the images H1 et al. Uh, where is this OXX G to H1 et al. K G. And local purity means this is surjective for any uh, regular local X. And which basically means that anything, any torso over the function, yeah, I should have said that with say fraction field K. So anything that's defined on the fraction field and that extends to the co-dimension one points actually comes from a torso. Uh, that's also satisfied for quite a number of groups. Like classical groups in characteristic zero. Again, by a work of Ivan Panin. There are a number of other cases, uh, orthogonal groups, G2, and some uh, statements about F4, all in one way or another uh, connected to Panin's work. And uh, if you have this local purity, 
then you get that this sheaf H1 et al. G is unramified, which basically means that the sections of this sheaf over a scheme X are exactly the sections over the function field, which extend over all the co-dimension one points. And this is a relevant statement because it allows to compute what the sheaf is. Right? It's then really going to be unramified torsos over the function field. And there is nothing else about the geometry of X that's necessary there. And then the last statement is sort of putting all these methods together. You can actually prove that the H1 et al. G, the classifying map, induces here a bijection to the sheaf of A1 connected components of the classifying space. And again, that means we have that this sheaf here is homotopy invariant under all the conditions I mentioned, uh, which proves the conjecture of Morel. And this sheaf is unramified, meaning that the connected components are really given as unramified torsos. So what we get finally is the first approximation to an answer what B et al. G classifies. In a sense, it's not so far away from et al. torsos, right? We see, although we do not have an isomorphism here, this map becomes an isomorphism after an Isnevich sheafification, which in particular means that we actually get, yeah, I mean, we should have said that, yeah, but there was no time. So this also means that uh, the, oh, if we look at sections over fields, this and this produce the same results so that we can in principle hope to get some results in Tulsa classification, maybe in the, an intermediate future using material homotopy theory. Okay, sorry, uh, I'm gonna stop here. Yeah, thank you very much for your interesting talk. Are there any questions? Um, let me ask you uh, once uh, 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 about some uh, question. Uh, can I uh, uh, draw, uh, do you, uh, uh, see this. Uh, can I draw somewhere and mm -hmm. uh, um, <laughs> so uh, is I, it okay I can, if I, will, I can stop will, sharing or I'm, no? I'm, I think I'm, I think it is uh, okay, uh, but uh, at just, least I uh, see it. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. So um, uh, maybe this is this will be better. Okay. So the first question is: uh, Can you say me what are uh, so is it true that L Zar? What are motivic replacements? Is it true that L Zar, L uh, A one? Uh, this uh, composition gives a replacement for all the objects like B G Nis, B G B Et G, and uh, G factor for H homogeneous spaces. Is it uh, uh, true for um, overfields? I mean. That this functor is uh, give, uh, applied to these objects uh, for uh, reductive groups uh, gives a um, materially local object. So I mean, it is true for B NIS G for isotropic groups. Yes. Um, for yes. et al., I don't think so. Oh. I think you really okay. need to iterate it. Um, yes, I like understand. The, okay. the usual definition. You need to iterate it infinitely many times until you get something. What we can say here is that sort of the connected components don't need the replacement. So over fields, right? Uh, that, so the connected oh, so, components uh, don't so, yes, change. So, so sheaf of connected components, so sheaf of L mod of G equals to sheaf uh, not of L. L1. This is a statement, yes? Uh, yeah, I think you, you don't even need uh, replacement. So you can, uh, okay, it depends on how you construct the B et al. G. Uh -huh. um, but I think, yeah, if, if you construct it in such a way that if you just take, so without any A1 stuff, uh, this thing really classifies et al. Torsus. Maybe I should have said that also. Uh, this thing uh, it really classifies et al. torsos if you don't do any A1 stuff to it. 
And then if you do this A1 replacement, uh, that potentially destroys stuff. Because, of course, you're enforcing A1 homotopy invariance. That's not true for etal torsos. So, but you can take this B etal G, and then it classifies torsos. And then if you just chiefify, you get the H1 etal G. And the statement mm -hmm. here is that uh, this is actually the same thing as if you would really do the full replacement for B et al. G and then take the, class of, uh, the, okay. the connected components and chiefify in the misnovation uh, of G. Uh, okay. So okay. for the connected components, you don't need that much fibrant replacement. I guess that sort of the, 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 the higher you go with the homotopy sheaves, the more you need to care about connected components. And, yeah, but yeah, not sure about that. Okay. Okay, thank, thanks. And also one related question. When is it true that these objects are, have a tile descent or a descent? I mean, again, this one, this one, and this one. When, uh, uh, for which uh, groups and uh, 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 for which object? Um, uh, so from what I understand, uh, this one, uh, have uh, a descent for the ln for any n. And uh, so uh, for, for this case, uh, is it true for uh, any reductive group or isotropic no. reductive group? So for the NIST G, you would only uh, automatically have Nisnevich descent and not necessarily et al descent. You, uh, I mean, so okay. et al descent you get because like et al locally trivial GLN bundles are automatically the risky locally trivial. And uh, for the B et al G, you get some uh, et al, some, some version of et al descent because you can glue et al torsos in the et al topology. But you need to be uh, mm -hmm. uh, careful, I guess. Um, uh, so, and say again here, uh, we have always Nisnevich descent, yes, uh, for any reductive group. Or, mm -hmm. uh, or not. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, thanks. Uh, uh, okay, yes. May I ask also a question, maybe a naive question about uh, uh, H et al. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, if we, uh, what is, uh, uh, what, uh, what does this object uh, and this object uh, represent in H et al of K, uh, uh, are they equivalent or, uh, uh, and do they represent et al torsors, uh, at least on some schemes, so. Yeah, maybe that's something that I can write uh, in the end. Um, oh. So for, uh, let's say the other way around, L over F, uh, any extension field under, uh, in particular, these conditions on this weak homotopy invariance for the groups, then we have that H1 et al G over the spectrum of L is the same thing as H1 et al spec L G and that's also the same thing as um, pi zero A one B et al G sections over spec L. So in this case, so to emphasize, under these uh, conditions on the homotopy invariance, but that's um, satisfied in a number of cases, uh, then what you really get is over fields, this thing really classifies etal torsos over the field. So in the case of uh, the group ON in characteristic not two, you can really say over a field, these connected components of the classifying space are really isometry classes of quadratic forms of rank N. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe uh, let me write it. Uh, so this so is basically what C uh, in particular implies. Uh -huh. And in some sense, that's actually the way. So, and, uh, sorry. 
No, please go ahead. Oh, yes, I wanted to ask again, ask again. So it doesn't mean still that this is a one variant and materially local, but there is inequality on for you know. So this object itself in a tal category is. Yeah, you can. So, you uh, in general, you still have to. Uh, I mean, for instance, to compute maps into it, or to compute uh, homotopy sheaves, or even yeah, the the A one connected components over uh, scheme, you really have to typically replace the B et al G. Okay, and, and there's as far as we know, not really much simplification. You really just have to do the vibrant replacement if you want to uh, this thing to behave homotopically correct oh, yeah I, I mean on on, on points so uh, is uh, uh, so it is only for you know so there is not an equality of uh, this uh, uh, in Ital A1, Ital A1, uh, on fields no uh, we can really just say something about pi zero and I don't know actually what happens with a higher homotopy. So I, yeah. So, but in the classical topology, is it true that it shifts, uh, so plan B uh, shifts the numbers of uh, this group, so? Yes, yes. If you take the classifying space of a group G, uh, the homotopy groups of the classifying space are the homotopy groups of G shifted one up. Yeah, but if, but for, for this two classifying space, I mean for the Italian for, for the for the Nisnevich one, is it also true? So is it known? Yes, but for the Italian, it is not. Yeah, for the Italian, I don't think we have results on what the homotopy uh, sheaves are. I mean, so maybe uh, so. Let me point out that this is actually, it is strange from the topological viewpoint that this should be non-trivial. And if you, you have this shift and this means that topologically the classifying spaces are always connected. And also these Nisnevich classifying spaces are A1 connected. But these things here are not. For instance, if you look at the group ON, you get the classification of quadratic forms which over fields can be quite non-trivial. So, what you get here is you have significant number of connected components, which somehow feels different from topology. It also means that somehow, I guess if you want to consider the homotopy sheaves, higher homotopy sheaves of this B et al G, you should always consider these things as being fibered over this non-trivial pi zero, which is something that would not appear in topology because spaces are connected. But somehow here, um, there, I mean, something non-trivial, I guess, happens with these higher homotopy sheaves. They would depend on the choice of uh, base point here. And it's not really clear to me what we should expect there. It's, uh, I find this a totally <laughs> interesting question, but I, uh, at this point, I can really not say much uh, about it, just that, before you even can start wondering about how does the homotopy sheaf, a higher homotopy sheaf of B et al G depend on the choice of base points, it's good to know what the base points actually are. <laughs> so that, that all of this is really just the first uh, small step. And just to clarify, you say that probably the homotopy types of these connected components are different, right? Yes. In, I guess that it has some, some in, in that it's in some way connected that uh, sort of also the group changes, right? If we look at quadratic forms again, uh, so pi zero here would be quadratic forms over the function field. And then of course, for every such quadratic form over the function field, you would have an orthogonal group associated to this. And somehow these groups should all influence what is in the homotopy sheaves of this B et al on then. So B et al. Uh, G should definitely have information in one way or another about forms of G over fields. Uh, 
and you probably said something about this before, but uh, can you say anything how Binis is related to the zeros? I mean, to to the component which contains the trivial point. You say something that it injects into this component, right? Yeah, I. I'm not sure I can prove it, but I can, so my, uh, the feeling is, maybe let's say uh, that this B NIS G maps to B et al G. Um, let's say it could be the inclusion of the connected component of the trivial torso. I think that's true, but um, I'm not sure if I've really, uh, it's, uh, if I could really prove it, if I had to sit down. <laughs> so, it sounds um, very, very interesting. I mean, and then you say that the other components just correspond to twisted forms of G, right? is for some twisted edges. Yes. So in some sense, what we get here is that A nis pi zero A one B et al G of X. That is, um, so under all these conditions again, uh, that's the isomorphism classes of un, so of torsos over over K, which extend over all co-dimension one points of X, uh, if X is irreducible smooth with function field K. So the components over a smooth scheme X, those are torsos under G over the function field. And that is really just forms of G over the function field, plus the condition that they need to extend over all the, the co-dimension one points. So it is forms of, uh, some forms of G that appear there. Um, and the, yeah, the problem is sort of, it would be nice if we could actually like in this picture here, have Venus G as the connected component of the trivial torso. And then we could reach all the other torsos by somehow twisting with a torso that's given in the connected component. But I don't really know how to do this because the torsos that I get here do not live over X, right? They are just required to, uh, they live over the function field, they extend over all co-dimension one point. So they would extend over, uh, part of X complement of a co-dimension two subset, but then sort of going between different connected components is then not quite possible. But maybe, maybe there's yeah. some way around that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but just again, uh, this uh, feeling that this bin is G is a connected component, it precisely says that, I mean, it is related to the questions that was asked before that higher homotopy groups are just homotopy groups of G. Yeah, because they are, the, they are this one on the left. Right. So there, uh, the, the, the components for the, I mean, so the higher homotopy groups for the base point for the trivial torso, then yeah. that would just be shifted homotopy sheets of G. Exactly. Yes. And then. Yeah, if this is strong. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, any more questions? Okay, I'm sorry, so wait, yeah. question. Does it make any sense to consider any other topologies? Uh, not uh, tile, this niche, maybe something stronger, something special for algebraic groups? Um, probably. 
I mean, so one of the things is, as long as we're dealing with just smooth schemes here, I think we don't really have so many different topologies, or I mean, a lot of the different topologies uh, produce the same results. So one of the things is that, in some sense, if you have Groton Dijk's error conjecture, then you know that the Zariski and his Nivich will produce the same results. And uh, if you're over smooth schemes, at the very beginning of the talk, you had this uh, theorem of the Sha um, So I think even FPQC torsos over smooth schemes over a field will already be at all locally trivial. So there are a lot of uh, things that just produce the same classifying spaces. And that's, I guess, why mostly B NIS and B et al have been considered. Um, I guess one could also ask what happens over non-smooth schemes and then look at CDH topologies. And I guess definitely there must be something interesting that happens there, but I have no idea what. I, I haven't really thought about this. Thank you.